Did I just do that? Good evening, everyone, and welcome. You know I'm Kate Marker, Executive Director here at Hillwood Estate Museum and Gardens, and it's a little sad to welcome you to our last of this series. We've had such a great time in this series, but I promise you, we have really saved a big treat for the last uh, of this series. So we are, I'm very much looking forward to this. Now, you know what you do now, right? <laughs> Silence your phones. Yes, exactly. I have them very well trained, Asia. That, you know, it just occurred that. to me, I don't think I silenced mine. <laughs> well, I hope it's on the not back. On you. Oh, it's on the back, yeah. you know. They'll never know it's yours. <laughs> That's what I was just thinking. That's right. It's like, That's if it right. rings, I could just sit here and look annoyed like it's someone else. <laughs> That's exactly right. Um, but I'm sure you know that the exhibition, even though our series sadly closes tonight, the exhibition goes on until January 7th. So I hope you'll come back. I hope you'll bring everybody you know, all your relatives. Make sure you tell everybody, because it is really such a special, special thing that we have. So, And then on November 8th, we're having um, the 6th annual Fred Fisher lecture. And for this one, we're having C.D. Dickerson speak on Casanova, the seduction of Europe. So C.D. Dickerson is the head of sculpture and decorative arts at the National Gallery. And he is one of the curators of the exhibition, Casanova, the seduction of Europe. And the reason why we're having him speak here this year is because, of course, Hillwood is lending to the exhibition, you want to guess what we're lending? A portrait of Catherine the Great. Oh. Of course, the seduction of Europe. Okay. Um, and I know many of you are uh, members, but if you haven't yet joined, you really need to because the Members Day is coming up in December when you get an extra 10% off in the store. So just saying. Okay. <laughs> Introduce, I, well, I'm very excited to introduce our speaker tonight. You, she is such an accomplished person. Um, she is an experienced jeweler. She is a trained scientist and historian. She studied ancient history and physics at the University of Chicago. She, pardon? <laughs> I said she was bright. Correct. <laughs> I do my best. Yes, Gordon, she is. Glad you, we have, we have no dummies out here. Just <laughs> she was the head of the auction division at the House of Khan Estate Jewelers, and she spent more than seven years as the senior designer at the LA-based fine jewelry company, Takori. So, you know, practitioner, scientist, historian, the entire package. Very bright girl, as Gordon <laughs> says. And of course, she is the author of the New York Times bestseller, Stoned, Jewelry, Obsession, and How Desire Shapes the World. So I hope you've all bought your books. If you haven't, you can buy them afterwards. And of course, there will be a book signing um, after we're finished here. So. This is, I hope you, I mean, I really, you know I've been promoting this book for the whole, for the entire series. I've been telling Thank everybody you. how great this book is and how you absolutely need to read it. Um, it's really about human motivation, and the three sections of the book are called Want, Take, Have. It's really, I mean, it's, 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 it's just such an interesting book. Um, why don't you start by telling us how you how this book came to be? I know you you talked about it started after you procla proclaimed that an engagement ring's value is really based on a human construct and, and probably that is such a nicer, more diplomatic way to say <laughs> it than what I said. Um, so I had just left Takori in Los Angeles and moved to London, and my roommate from the University of Chicago was throwing herself a birthday party in Paris and she was coming through London on a book tour because she's a novelist and she said come to my birthday party and I said okay and um, she she throws exceptional parties it was several days long in Paris <laughs> and everyone was you know somewhat overserved 
with the champagne, and I was sitting next to a woman who was very sober because she was very pregnant, and she had her hands on her stomach like this, you know? And I had noticed that the engagement ring and the wedding ring she was wearing were ones that I had designed several years before. And at one point during the evening, she said, so I heard you're a jewelry designer. And I said, yes. And she said, well, what kind of jewelry do you design? And I said, well, that kind. <laughs> and she said, engagement rings. And I said, no, Pumpkin, your engagement ring. I, I designed your engagement ring and your wedding ring. And um, she was, you know, delighted. And she was like, no, really? Oh my God, Stephen, her husband, and now my book agent, um, <laughs> she, she said, she designed my ring. And I was like, oh yeah, I did his too. And I guess she got him as a set. And he asked the question men always ask when they know that you're in the jewelry industry, which is, you know, how much is it worth? Or did I get a good deal? Or he said, is it a good one? And I thought he meant the ring. And I said, of course it's a good one. I don't design bad ones. The question is that. And he said, no, the diamond. And I said, uh, yeah, it's great. Because we're in a dark, like, smoky bar, and I'm not going to get out a loop and appraise it for him. And he, you know, suddenly was so upset. He was like, what do you mean? It's not? And he started to doubt its value, and he wouldn't stop hammering me about, but what's wrong with it? No, tell me the truth. What's wrong with it? Why isn't it a good one? And I said, no, it's great, man. It's really, it's excellent. I can totally tell in here. And he just kept saying, tell me the truth, tell me the truth, until finally, my frayed and, and slightly champagne-soaked nerves, I just said, you want the truth? The truth is, it, diamonds are all exactly the same and none of them are worth anything. <laughs> and, um, and everybody was sort of like... <laughs> and his wife said, well, yeah, that, that's interesting because I'm pretty sure we paid for it. How does that work? <laughs> and we started to talk about... Um, I tried to explain the De Beers diamond cartel and how, you know, there was a time when they were rare and therefore valuable and then there was a diamond rush in South Africa that was so epic it started with a little boy named Erasmus Jacobs wading into the Orange River and hurting his foot on a diamond. Like, there were a lot of diamonds and then it turned out not to be a rush because it never ended. And there are so many diamonds now that at this point just the ones that have been cut into you know, sparkly jewelry diamonds that are above ground in human hands, there's, there's enough for every man, woman, and child on the planet to have a half a carat diamond mm. with, I think, I think it's a half a million, half a billion carats left over. There, there are a lot of diamonds. And he was so upset by this. And he said, oh, it's, you know, it was never real. And I was like, no, no, it was. I mean, there was a time when they were incredibly scarce. The French Revolution started over a diamond necklace. And at that point, he asked my friend, can she write? <coughs> and my friend remembered me as a physics major and said, I don't think she can even read. Um, <laughs> but, which was fair, because you know, she used to do some of my reading assignments for me, and I'd do some of her math. Not that anyone at the University of Chicago ever cheated on doing their homework. But um, yeah, they sort of goaded me into this <coughs> over the course of several days. And, I said, fine, but you know, only if I can call it stoned. <laughs> and I didn't think it would, you know, anything would come of it. But they they pursued it, and I can be dared to do anything. Is the moral of that story? <laughs> like anything, really. Well, I mean, you've started talking about diamonds. So how about if we continue with the story about De Beers and a diamond is forever? Yeah, well, it's my favorite. It's the most brilliant marketing strategy. It, it is the most brilliant marketing strategy ever. And it was named by Advertising Age as the, the definitive and most influential <coughs> advertising slogan and campaign of the last century. And there weren't really advertising campaigns before the 20th century. So that's ever. But my favorite thing about that expression, sort of a footnote, but it's that diamonds are not forever, actually. And I don't mean that in some esoteric way about their value and changing perceptions. I mean they're literally not forever. When you dig them up and take them out of the ground, they're at standard temperature and pressure. Everything is, you know, that, that we encounter. It's, um, so they're not at standard temperature and pressure 
underground in mines under millions of tons of rock. And <coughs> that pressure is what turns carbon into coal or into graphite or into diamonds, depending on how much pressure there is. And if it's been turned into a diamond, it locks its atoms into place, sort of the way if you're on a subway car or something, you might mill around if it's empty or sit down if there are people. But if there are a lot of people, you kind of, you know, you define your space, like, mm -hmm. stay away from me because people are bumping into you. And that's basically what the carbon atoms do. And it turns out it's really pretty, and um, especially if you cut it in certain ways. But when you take them out of the ground and they're no longer under all of that pressure, they start to relax the atoms and the diamond start to kind of relax a little bit. And anyone in the room who's wearing a diamond, that, that diamond is right now very slowly converting back into pencil lead. That's the next <laughs> least uh, organized structure that it takes is graphite. So they're not forever. Um, <laughs> I, just, I just like that fact. Um, but yeah, so De Beers, essentially, this man, Cecil Rhodes, was uh, looking for something to do. He was a colonialist extraordinaire, uh, hence Rhodesia. That's where it got its name. Um, he wanted to build a railroad that went across Africa. I mean, he was looking for a way to make a buck, basically. And Africa looked like a great place to do it for him. And a few of his plans failed. He couldn't get uh, the local government on board with what he wanted to do. And then this diamond rush started, and he couldn't afford to buy a diamond mine, so he bought pumps. He bought up all the pumps, because diamond mines are below ground, and they are filled with groundwater a lot of the time, and they have to be constantly pumped out. And so he got, this is a foreshadowing of what he did with diamonds, he bought all the pumps and wouldn't let anybody have any. <laughs> and he charged outrageously inflated rates for these water pumps, like half your diamond mine, and you can have a pump. And that was how he got his first diamond mine, then a second, and, a second. and over the course of a decade or two, he managed to consolidate almost all of the diamond mines in South Africa. And there was one really big one, more to the point, one that a really big stone came out of. And that was the Cullinan. That's the one that all those crown jewels are cut from. Which actually, Caroline de Guito talked to us about that very stone on September 28th. So oh, we've okay. Well, so heard then about it. you've heard yes. about the surveyor who fainted when he saw it from De Beers. And when your surveyor faints, it's time to make a deal. <laughs> so they combined their interests and formed the De Beers Diamond Company. And they had a stranglehold on the market. And they realized that there were too many diamonds. Basically, it's a good problem to have, I guess, but not if you're selling them. And um, the man he combined his business with, Oppenheimer, decided that the only way to maintain the value of diamonds was to maintain the illusion that they were rare. And they would do that by stockpiling them and just lying about how many they had. Mm -hmm. And it worked really well until World War II. And it's not that they were exposed, it's that the people they were selling them to went broke or died or were dethroned like the Romanovs. And they no longer had people to sell their diamonds to because all of the money when the dust settled had reconsolidated in the United States, in this new burgeoning middle class, which had never existed before. And this vast amount of wealth had been transferred to these people, but not in a small number of people's hands, in mm -hmm. millions of people's hands. And so everybody had expendable income, and they, they wanted to buy things with it, but they didn't have very much. They just had a little bit. and so. De Beers, and they were blocked from doing business in the United States because of antitrust laws, hired an advertising agency, N.W. Ayer. And this was the very beginning of that golden age of madmen advertising. And they hired them and they said, help us sell people diamonds, even though we're blocked from doing business there directly. And it was a, a really clever workaround, which was they didn't sell them diamonds loose, they didn't sell them to beers, they just sold them on the idea of this product they invented, which was the diamond engagement ring. Because it didn't exist before that. I mean, sometimes people had engagement rings, occasionally they might have diamonds in them, but the diamond engagement ring was made up as a marketing technique to sell people half carat to one and a half carat white diamonds. 
and moreover to make them think they needed them. They invented that entire advertising model where you sell people <coughs> an idea instead of a product. You sell people a notion of a lifestyle, of status, of that people are judging you if you don't have it, uh, that you're not really married, you're not really engaged if you don't have a diamond ring, or that people are at least going to wonder why not. And they gave them away to free, for free to movie stars and to studios and had them worn in movies. They gave them to people at the top of society and made sure their picture was taken with this engagement ring. And they basically invented product placement and uh, it, it worked so incredibly well that most people don't realize diamond engagement rings are as old as microwaves. <laughs> true. True. 40s, really. Yeah. yeah. You also talk about, in the book, if I mean, th this, this book has so many fabulous stories in it. It, it really goes on and on. Um, but, and talks a lot about human motivation. And you talk a lot about what we can understand about people based on their jewelry. And we, we went through the spectacular exhibition together oh. earlier today. <laughs> so I'm just wondering what strikes you about Marjorie Merriweather Post? What, do, what can you tell just by looking at Marjorie Merriweather Post jewelry? Um, she was intelligent. She, she also had an obsessive compulsive disorder, I think. But, um, <laughs> I mean, there are collectors and, and then the there are hoarders. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Nobody's gonna call you a hoarder if you're hoarding gems, but it is what it is, you know. Um, no, she was intelligent. She was yeah. she was fascinated by historical pieces and gemstones that either had this provenance or that were unique or rare or important in some way. Uh, she has a lot of conch pearls, which mm. a lot of people don't even know what they are. But you would have to you would have to have an eye for what's special and outside of what you've been told to want to collect something like that. Yeah. Well, that's nice to hear. She also, of course, loved emeralds. Well, who and doesn't? Who doesn't? <laughs> well, that's actually, that's um, a wonderful story in your book, Who Doesn't, you know. about why we're attracted to these green stones. I just wonder if you would talk a little bit about emeralds, because there's, there, I mean, as you can see, there's one right on the cover of the book. That was originally a sapphire, and they asked me to okay the cover, and I was like, well, you know, I do like green. <laughs> and I guess they found me to be a little annoying in the cover process, and they were like, fine, done, it's an emerald, <laughs> just, are we good? <laughs> I was like, okay. Um, but, yeah, so people, I mean, you don't just like diamonds because De Beers told you to. It's a big part of why they cost what they cost and why you think they're worth what they cost. But human beings evolved, and they evolved to look for certain things. And one of the reasons we all like diamonds is that they sparkle. And we've been evolving for millions of years to look for sparkles. Not because diamonds are valuable, because water is. Because when you see something that shines or glitters or that little speck of light, that says water to the part of your brain in the back that's been evolving since you were not even human. And so we're all fundamentally drawn to glitter, to shine. And then there are other things that, that light up reward pathways in your brain, and one of them is the color green. It actually has a physiological effect on you when you see it. Anything between to certain wavelengths in the visible spectrum. They're basically these shades of green. They cause blood vessels to dilate. They cause your heart rate to slow. You actually see them and you feel good, physically and emotionally. It's why prisons are painted green inside and hospitals are often painted green because people have known for a long time that the color green made people get better faster and it made people stay calm. and it. Nero, the crazy emperor, actually had a pair of glasses that uh, he liked to watch the games through them, but the primary reason he had them was because he had migraines and also fits of rage, is how they were described. Um, he was insane, obviously, but <laughs> he would wear these glasses that were thin slices of emerald because it was supposed to calm down his fits. And we all love green, whether we think it's our favorite color or not. Biologically, it's your favorite color. 
because you evolved to look for green. Green says mm -hmm. water just like sparkles. Green says plants. Green says edible. It, it's survival instincts. Well, talk a little bit about how um, emeralds are formed, because emeralds are formed differently from the way diamonds are. Yeah. Well, all gemstones are formed in a variety of different ways, but emeralds are really interesting and very rare because they, they're uh, beryllium, aluminum, cyclosilicate, and what they are is a barrel crystal, which is basically colorless, and they've been contaminated while they were growing. This crystal that should have been clear and plain, almost like quartz, was contaminated with chromium. And the chromium made them turn this incredible green color. They could also be contaminated with iron and turn blue. They could be, I mean, they cut bar barrel crystals come in all different colors. But the green ones are special. And they're special in part because they're so beautiful and in part because they're so rare. They only occur in suture zones. And suture zones, like the Andes or the Himalayas, are places where the Earth's crust at one point in the past slammed into another piece of it and went under, almost like hitting an SUV with a sedan. And it pushed it up, and it made those jagged, tall mountains. It's called orogenesis. It's how mountain ranges are created. But in the process of that happening, the, the sedan, the plate that hit from underneath, was the crust under the ocean. And it had small quantities of chromium in it. And when it hit the bigger one and drove it upwards, the force of that created an enormous amount of heat and water from the first one percolated upwards, basically like a coffee percolator. And it went through these chambers of rock as it was forming. And as those crystals were growing, they were contaminated with chromium, which they would otherwise never have come in contact with because chromium is on the seafloor and barrel crystals grow in mountain chambers. So. If this event hadn't happened two or three times in the history of Earth, there wouldn't be any emeralds. So there. <laughs> so, so they're not just pretty. They're, they're a rare stone that's a remnant of a rare event in the Earth's yeah. geological history. And, and people have been sort of fighting over them and... Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah people... Emeralds are one of the few stones that have been with the exception of one, one crash because of the Spanish Empire carting millions of carats of them into Spain over the course of a couple of years after they found them in Colombia. With the exception of that one moment in history, they've been one of the few gemstones that have been consistently considered precious and extraordinarily valuable throughout human history. There are actually paleolithic, there's a paleolithic I believe it's referred to as a rank signifying headdress. It just means crown. Right. And it's made out of bone and resin and emeralds. Not cut like you'd think, but people have valued them for as long as they've valued anything. And yeah, the fight over them in Europe and in Spain was a big part of the modern economic system that we all live with. It started because they, there were so many coming from Colombia and Spain was spending the money faster than they could get it, and they managed to get these bankers in the Netherlands to give them loans based on the notion that this supply of emeralds would never end. And they invented something called the Juro, which was uh, basically a piece of paper with a government seal on it, and it was the first government-backed interest-bearing bond. And it funded, over the next few centuries, this concept that you could invest in not yet received wealth from the new world because everyone had supreme confidence in it. It backed the modern economic engine of banking as we know it. Fascinating. It's fascinating how everything somehow goes back to gems. <laughs> Every concept goes back to gems. Um, one of the things I think that you mentioned that, that distinguishes Marjorie Post, it was her interest in historic gems. and. They really do, they captured her attention, they actually capture our attention too, um, and there are some really great stories in the book uh, about historic gems like La Peregrina of Pearl, 
for example, that would, we would love to hear about that story. <laughs> the necklace that kind of hastens the French Revolution. There are some just absolutely sensational stories in the book that I'd love for you to tell oh, us. Well, thank you. Um, those two are actually, they're put together in the book, they're right next to each other as chapter four and five because they're in the middle section, take. So the first section, want, is about what makes a stone a gem? Why is something more valuable than something else? You know, whether it's the story of emeralds or it's the story of diamonds and advertising. That's sort of an examination of why we want what we want and why we value what we value. The next section, take, is more about what we're willing to do to get it. And it's not so much about um, value as it is worth. It's about worth and worthlessness and the moral value we ascribe to inanimate objects. Um, because one necklace, it didn't belong to Marie Antoinette, but everyone believed it did. This massive diamond necklace that sort of, you know, knocked down the first domino in starting the French Revolution. It was like a wearable chandelier. It went down, you know, <laughs> past your waist and wrapped around your body a few times. And it was crazy. It was great. I would totally wear it. <laughs> and um, I would. I would. I would wear it. I'd be wearing it right now if I had it. But um, it was more like a garment made out of diamonds. And it wasn't made for her. It was made for Madame de Berry, who was the mistress of her grandfather. And she was also arguably a prostitute. And Marie Antoinette is a uh, very misunderstood historical figure. People think of her as uh, kind of slutty, kind of crazy with the money, and actually she was a very conservative Austrian woman. <laughs> and uh, she was under orders, basically, from her really scary mother, who was the Austro-Hungarian empress, um, to act French, look French, make those French people like you, we need a treaty with them. and her sort of socially awkward daughter was not good at it and mm -hmm. she did it badly and everybody sort of made fun of her and you know she she overdid it <laughs> and she really only overdid it for a few years and then she just gave up she was like to hell with it and also her mother died <laughs> and um, <laughs> and she stopped and uh, you know that's when shabby became chic and she started dressing like a shepherdess but <laughs> in the meantime her gra her father's grand her, her husband's grandfather died and this necklace that he had commissioned for his girlfriend, who was an actress, which is why I said some people suggested maybe she was a prostitute, was finished. And the thing is, Marie Antoinette really didn't like Madame de Berry. She thought she was gross. She was kind of a mean girl. And so she had her kicked out of court after he died. And then the jewelers, Balmer and, Bassan, um, Balmer and Bassange, had finished this massive piece of jewelry, and they hadn't been paid for it because you don't make the king pay up front. And they were desperate to sell it because they were bankrupt otherwise. And so they tried to sell it to her. And she said, I know who that was for. <laughs> Gross. Or Get out. And over the course of several years, they tried repeatedly to sell it to her. And they did an end run around her and tried to sell it to her husband as a gift for her. He fell for it. She said, what are you doing? We're in debt up to our eyeballs in the war effort in America. Like that." That necklace cost more than a, a ship. And it was basically the most expensive necklace in the world. And the problem with it was no one could afford to pay for it. And what finally happened was somebody stole it. A con artist um, named, the, her name was Jeanne Valmont. And she claimed that lineage sort of in a shady way. But she weaseled her way into court. And she heard about this necklace. and. She made friends with a cardinal that Marie Antoinette also didn't like and had sort of shooed away from court. And she convinced him that they were BFFs and that she could fix this rift in their relationship. And, you know, she was a con woman and she sort of was using him. And ultimately, she had her eyes on the prize, which was this necklace. And she convinced him that Marie Antoinette really wanted it, but she didn't want to be seen to be buying it while people were starving to death. And if he bought it for her, she'd pay him. She just wanted the necklace. And of course he did. And the woman took it and gave it to her boyfriend, and he ran off with it. And that was the end of that necklace. Um, but, but the jewelers at some point wanted to be paid, and it all came out in the wash. Simultaneously, the tabloid media was being invented in Europe. 
When you think of the printing press, you think of the Gutenberg Bible. You think of global literacy. You think wonderful intellectual things. The truth is, the first thing they printed was the Gutenberg Bible. The second thing they printed was porn. <laughs> and the third thing they printed was tabloids. <laughs> and the Some it things never change. Never, <laughs> never. And the it girl of the tabloid media for most of her life was Marie Antoinette. And they made up a lot of what was in it. And in this case, there was a giant trial. It was declared the trial of the century when they found out that this necklace had been stolen. And she wasn't actually on trial. The woman who stole it was. And she was convicted, and so was her boyfriend who forged letters for Marie Antoinette. And, and the cardinal got in trouble and said he'd pay for the necklace, just you know, make it stop. And the only person who wasn't in trouble was Marie Antoinette. But, but because of these tabloids and because because they were circulated with pictures, so people who couldn't read could still tell what they were about. That's actually who they were intended for. Nobody was too clear on the actual truth of it, and it was one of the few actual charges against her when she was beheaded, was that she was a jewel thief and an embezzler. Very unfair. Well, but you know, it goes to, um, like I said, the worth or, or worthlessness yeah. of a thing or a person and the moral dimension that we attribute to these things. Mm -hmm. um, I, I talked at the end of that chapter about the French blue, which was this giant blue diamond that she owned. And um, it was one of the few pieces that was never recovered. Uh, all the crown jewels were stolen during the trial. And most of them were recovered because the thieves were actually really drunk. They, it went on for three days, and the third day there were so many of them, and they brought musicians, and some of them were still laying there unconscious when the police showed up, and it was like a very French jewel heist, and um, it turned into a party really quickly. But the French blue was never recovered until it turned up in the collection of Henry Philip Hope in the 1800s, and um, it had been cut down significantly, and we know it as the Hope Diamond. Right. And we heard about the Hope Diamond uh, yeah. two weeks ago when oh. we had Jeff Post here, who is the curator of the Hall of Gems and Jewels. So you know that the story of the curse is largely made up, mm -hmm. sort of like engagement rings. It was made up to sell a diamond no one could sell. Mm -hmm. And he sold it to another woman who loved jewelry, this heiress, Evelyn Walsh McLean. Mm -hmm. And she was so larger than life that this, this sort of lie about the curse just inflated, and um, she had a lot in common with the public perception of Marie Antoinette. She really did spend all that money, and she really, she really did have kind of a wild lifestyle. And, you know, Marie Antoinette's earrings are in this exhibit. They are They're indeed. They're gorgeous. Nobody's scared to touch those, right? <laughs> Nobody's scared to stand in front of the case and look at those for too long. So, you know, why do we attach this moral significance yeah. to the Hope Diamond? And what I think is interesting is that it has less to do with who owned it than it does the size. Those giant diamonds, almost all of them have a curse story with them. And what's really interesting is most of them have the same curse story. And yet everyone believes that it. it's true about this one. But it's the same story. It's that someone stole it from the third eye of a Hindu idol and ran off with it. It's very specific. And you have to, I question, like, why this story? I mean, first of all, who wants to traffic in stolen goods, really? especially if they've been stolen from like a church or a house of worship of some kind. And the question is, you know, did this actually happen once and nobody remembers which diamond it was? Or is this a story that's been made up to justify how someone can own something that valuable? Which I think is more likely. You know, this, this notion of the giant cursed diamond is almost like a moral explanation mm -hmm. for what would offset someone having that much more than everyone else. Okay. Interesting. Well, how about if we talk about pearls? Well, yes, pearls are cool. Pearls yeah. are, um, most people don't realize that unless you're really into antique jewelry, you've never seen a real pearl. Yeah. Even the most expensive pearls that people buy are cultured. All pearls are cultured at this point because in the wild, you know, you see all of those antique jewels and paintings and people are wearing big pearls, but the fact is it took all of human history to accumulate that many of them. Most of them, when you find them, are only a couple millimeters across. 
and they're a funny shape and they're a funny color and even when you find a big one they're never round it's almost impossible to match a whole strand of them it would take you know one pearl dealer their entire life approximately so pearls are very cool because culture doesn't mean fake culture just means somebody grew it on purpose like um, a field of corn or an apple orchard it's still real corn it's still real apples it's, it's not happenstance you didn't discover it in the wild and what's really interesting about it is that there was this man who specifically made it his goal to figure out how to culture pearls, Mikimoto, a man named Kokichi Mikimoto. And um, he did. And he essentially, by the way, invented biotechnology because that's what pearl culturing is. It's a fusion of farming, animal husbandry, depending on how you look at the oysters, and technological interference in the process. And it was streamlined, and it took him 20 years, but he figured out how to do it. And it also was a big part of Japan's economy because it happened at a time they were re-emerging on the world stage. Uh, there was some gunship diplomacy. Americans needed to be able to refuel with coal on their way to China, so they forced Japan to interact with them. And Japan had not done that in hundreds of years. They had a policy of no outside visitors, no outside contact. It was very much a hermit kingdom. But things weren't bad there. They were, they were reasonably nice. It just didn't change much for hundreds of years. So pre-Meiji Japan was still feudal. They, there were still samurais and geishas. And the problem is this tiny island, they didn't have a lot of domestic products when they reemerged on the world stage in the early 20th century. They basically have none. And they were really afraid they were going to be turned into a colonial territory to be exploited. And they didn't want that to happen. So they declared, Emperor Meiji declared that we're going to essentially, as many people have, <coughs> we're going to catch up with and overtake the West. Except they Except actually they did, did it. it. They right? did it. It worked. <laughs> it worked really well. I mean, it was a brutal period in their history culturally because people were forced to abandon a lot of things, a lot of traditions. Um, but there were a lot of upsides, too. Mikimoto was a peasant. And he would not have been allowed to be a scientist, let alone a merchant, which is what he really considered himself. And he would not have been allowed to marry aristocracy. He married the daughter of a samurai. And uh, she helped him. They were partners until she died. And so there were, there were a lot of wonderful things that came out of that, including the biotech industry that we all still like. And pearls for everyone. <laughs> that was his end goal. And it was Japan's first and only domestic product. They didn't produce anything else there. They would take things from other places and, and make things out of them. <coughs> but they didn't specifically grow anything or have anything that was for sale to the West until Mikimoto. And then, like diamonds are forever, we all believe that because we've heard it so many times. Everybody thinks of pearls as coming from East Asia. Most people don't realize that cultured pearls come from East Asia. Real pearls never came from East Asia. They came from near Bahrain. They came from the Red Sea. They were always a Middle Eastern export product. You know, there was a big pearl exhibition in the Middle East not mm -hmm. too long ago. But I think it's fascinating that in just the current um, town and country, the Mikimoto ad as the originator of cultured pearls since 1893. I mean, it's, they're, they're still very proud of that. They should be. Of that being their history, for sure. So did, did the um, introduction of cultured pearls then change the value of pearls on the market? Well, yes. Um, before the introduction of cultured pearls, there, <coughs> there were so few of them that they were outrageously valuable. Uh, a woman named May Plant wanted a pearl necklace that was for sale, or at least was owned by Cartier. And uh, this is a great story. And it, it's a double strand natural pearl necklace, and this was just a couple years before Mickey Moto debuted his his grown pearls. And it was so valuable, her husband traded one of their homes. It's a townhouse in Manhattan that has been the headquarters of Cartier ever since until a couple years ago. Yeah. And unfortunately, a couple of years later, cultured pearls were debuted. And it was such a threat to the pearl industry of the West 
that they tried everything they could come up with to keep cultured pearls off the market. They tried smear campaigns. They tried disinformation campaigns, telling people they're not real pearls, but not explaining why. Um, they even tried tariffs. They tried taxing Asian pearls to a degree that would make them impossible to buy. But ultimately, they failed. And um, people got to see these pearls, in part because this man, Mikimoto, was such a showman. He liked to make things out of them that weren't necklaces and then enter them in world's fairs. And uh, he liked to outline his process, not enough that you could steal it because it was patented, but enough that it would interest you and have it published in places where average people would read about it. And his sort of piece de resistance was he took a bunch of pearls that were not perfect, like a big barrel full of them, and in front of all these photographers and reporters, he shoveled them into a trash can fire. And he said, these are really only good for burning. Why would you want ugly pearls when you can have pearls that look like mine? And it was one of the single most brilliant publicity stunts ever. When you watch someone shovel these things into a fire and throw them away, you can't help but walk away with the idea that they can't be that valuable. <laughs> and he also sort of cultured pearls. There were so many more of them that it's not that it was initially easier to make them perfectly round or make them perfectly white, let alone other colors that people came to like. Um, it was that they had a much broader base to choose from, to match them with each other. And then eventually they started hybridizing them like roses to grow with certain sheens and certain colors. And, and it, re it sort of reset the bar mm -hmm. for, for perfection. And, in that way, it didn't end up tanking the value of pearls the way it could have, which is what all of those pearl dealers were worried about, was that pearls would become semi-precious stones. And instead, it just set this precedent that nobody wanted anything except perfect pearls. Perfect, round pearls, big pearls, white pearls, pearls that nobody owned before the 20th century because they just didn't exist. Yeah. But then how do you... Um Compare them to, say, conch pearls. I mean, conch pearls can't be cultured, can they? Oh, well, not officially. But a few years ago, I, I was talking to one of the executives from Mikimoto, and they said they've been working on it for a long time. And they, he said they've had some result, which, you know, I guess was all he was willing to say. But they're working on it. Yeah. And, but as of right now, you can't buy cultured conch pearls. So they're terribly expensive. Yeah. They're expensive the way rare things are expensive because ultimately what people want is to have something other people can't have. Right. I mean, that's the basis of value. value. Yeah, yeah. And what about the uh, irregular Baroque pearls? I mean, I'm thinking of that necklace that's the b big Baroque pearls and yeah. stones and diamonds. Yeah, they're, you know, in the 20th century, they have not been considered traditionally as valuable as round ones mm -hmm. because you know, before, just being a pearl, or being a big pearl, was enough to make something priceless. But now it's got to be a perfect pearl, yeah. because there, are, there really are so many more of them. And they actually do still throw away most of them. They grind them up and make calcium supplements out of them. <laughs> they, uh, they do all kinds of... We're they, eating them. They gr <laughs> no, it was one of the big places that um, the Japanese population got their calcium during World War II, because there, were, there was food rationing, and they don't have a lot of calcium-rich crops, so they ended, Mikimoto ended up uh, dedicating a ton of pearls to this, and he said, you know, grind them up, they're just calcium, people can eat them, and they've been doing it ever since. Well, there's one, I just want to ask you one more question, and then I will open it up and let you all ask, because I'm sure you all have lots of questions of your own, um, but technology is an interesting through line in your, in your book. And can you talk a little bit about how and why technology and jewelry are linked? I can. It's the third book in this series. <laughs> um. Yes, yeah, so the next one is going to be hammered, and the one after that is going to be rocked. So, Yeah, so actually, yes, you, you did identify a, a theme here that's going somewhere, because the last chapter in the book is about the first wristwatch and how it came to be, and why it existed, and, and the woman who commissioned it, and why. And why we don't think of watches as women's jewelry, but as the male equivalent of a diamond ring, or a 
strand of pearls. It's you know the one piece of jewelry we expect them to have, and it's very much status signifying. And it has to do with World War One, and you know I don't think we have time to tell the whole story, but ultimately this woman who was trying to outdo a rival ended up inventing or or getting Patek Philippe to make for her the first wristwatch, and then wars became very technological very quickly. The Boer War and then World War One, and people couldn't use pocket watches anymore, and they remembered that the rich women of Europe loved these wristlets, and they tried breaking the front off a pocket watch and strapping it down and it was called a strap watch and they came back from the Boer War and said this we need these this is important you can't really fire a machine gun without this or fly an airplane or you know time a barrage and so they there was a company called Rolex founded specifically to make big manly stainless steel trench watches and the British and the Americans had them in World War One and the Germans did not and it is one of the major but unsighted usually pieces of technology that contributed to the victory and where it landed. Absolutely amazing. They're, so let me open it up to all of you. I'm sure you all have lots of questions for this most fascinating dinner partner you could ever have, right? <laughs> so what question? Yes, Doug. If you could select one piece from the Meriwether Post collection. Uh, we had this. <laughs> we already, we've done this once That's today. That's the most interesting, or if I could wave a magic wand and say one of them would belong to you, what would be your choice? Which one? Hmm. Can, can and, and you repeat why? the question? For the oh, if you could have one piece. I'm sure every single person in this audience has already had this exercise for themselves, <laughs> but we're asking you. Um, if you could choose to have one piece of jewelry out of the spectacular exhibition, what would it be? And why? And why? I don't know. It's hard. It's a woman after my own heart. I know. You know? It's really like, hard. Um, I think probably the Marie Therese necklace, the, that big diamond. I love jewelry that disassembles and reassembles, like transformers. It's like, I actually collect that stuff. It's, I just love it, and I love that the you know, I like the different alternating drops, and there's so much you could do with that. And I like the history, too. Napoleon was a weird guy. Oh, yeah. Super weird. And, um, yeah, I think probably that one. And that, that one, actually, of course, it, I'm, I'm happy about that, because that belongs to the Museum of Natural History. So we would still have our whole collection intact. <laughs> if it's a Excellent. <laughs> right, Jeff will be very upset. but. Yes, I mean, I do love that emerald ring, though. Oh, well. Uh, well, one of them is his, too. <laughs> you can have his. Yeah. So, so what was your question? Actually, mine's a multi. So <coughs> Queen Elizabeth II has pearls. She, she's always wears three strand pearls like she wears them all the time. So are they culture? They're a historic. I mean, because her mom had them. So yeah, them. so I've culture. actually seen. Um, a lot of them are just family heirlooms. So, I mean, we're talking about jewelry that belongs to a royal family. So, the question, make sure everybody's heard it. Oh, Elizabeth II, you know, wears a lot of pearls. Are they cultured? And the answer is some of them. Yeah, the, the newer ones, the ones in the last, you know, 60 to 80 years are absolutely cultured. And, um, but the thing is, that's not a bad thing. That's, yeah. they're, they're just pearls, mm -hmm. you know? I, I keep on thinking of the Elizabeth the first and you know her obsession with that, with pearls with yeah that pearl that big old one that she la peregrina yeah 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 which where yeah she kind of did a reverse marie antoinette and yeah. made herself look look <laughs> feminine and saintly and mm -hmm. virginal and she created this whole cult around herself called gloriana which was basically the worship of this icon she had invented mm -hmm based on herself. It actually worked really well in a time of religious upheaval, basically. And it got people to stop asking her, when are you going to get married? <laughs> but um, I might try it. Um, <laughs> let's start a cult. That'll work. Um, but yeah, so I think she would have loved cultured pearls. She liked all pearls. Oh, yeah. She liked her cousin's pearls after she cut her head off, Mary Queen of Scots. Those were black pearls. Those were cool. and. Um, she wanted her sister's pearl. There's a chapter about it in here. La Peregrina, it's this giant drop-shaped pearl. And 
she never got it, but she was painted wearing three or four different pieces of jewelry that look a lot like it. It was a similar pearl suspended from a sim similar big square diamond brooch, which sort of suggests that she didn't care if it was the one her sister had. She just wanted one like it. So I think she would have loved cultured pearls. Yeah, well, quite she would have all about that. Both so, natural and cultured yeah, pearls, so the too. Black, so the black pearls that we see nowadays, they're, they're cultured, right? And black pearls Unless cultured, it's an antique pearl or somebody specifically makes a point of saying these are not cultured pearls. Anything you see for sale is a cultured pearl. And then can you speak to coral? When we see carved coral? What about it? Well, when we see carved <coughs> coral, and then there's like, there's carved coral, and then there's carved coral that's vintage, and I mean, I know yeah. you're not supposed to touch coral now. Well, I was just gonna say some of it's legal and some of it's not, but once it's out of the water, it's hard to say when it was fished out of the water, so that legal, illegal thing is like ivory. It's like, don't be a bad person, but nobody's gonna be able to tell if you are, or you're not gonna get sent to jail or have it confiscated. Right. Just yeah. don't be a jerk. Right. Um, yeah. Because like, maybe don't make jewelry out of living things. But yeah, so coral is something that people have been making jewelry out of for thousands of years. And the main reason it's not kosher at this point is because of overfishing, essentially. And if cultured pearls hadn't been invented, it, it's very likely oysters would be extinct at this point because they were being so terribly overfished looking for pearls. Wow. Thank you. Phyllis. Phyllis. <coughs> Would you comment on the mystique of jade in Asia and why it's never really taken hold in Western art is what I, I know. I don't think there's a piece of jade in the, um, in the Moses <coughs> There's a ton in the house. Yeah. In the house, she yes. had lots of carved yes. jade, of but course. Jadeite, you know, um, in, in well, there's jadeite and there's nephrite, right. and people confuse the two. But um, nephrite comes in a lot of very cool colors. When people talk about purple jade or lavender jade, that's actually nephrite. And it's very similar to jadeite, but that only comes in green and white and a sort of brown color. And it is an extremely valuable, precious gem in Asia, specifically China, the green and the white most of all. And I think, I mean, if I had to put a reason on why it doesn't have the same allure in the West that it does in the East, it's a sort of ingrained tradition that, I think I said in the book, shininess is next to godliness or, or sparkliness or something. We're taught to value gemstones we even, there's even a scale, the more hardness scale, based on how much it sparkles. Diamonds are at the top, and they sparkle the most, and they're the hardest. And then sapphires, and, and you go down it, and you get to less and less valuable stones. And we just have this notion that if it doesn't sparkle, it's not bling. And mm. jade's pretty, but it doesn't sparkle. And the most valuable jade, it's called um, imperial jade or noble jade, is this apple green color that the really good stuff is very hard to tell from an emerald. It looks just like emeralds. So, you know, there isn't really an opening for it, I think. Okay, yes. I want to switch us to sapphires, blue sapphires. Ooh, sapphires, um, yay. One of the, the paragraphs in Spectacular tells a great story, and I wonder if you know anything about this stone that Carrie Winston lent to Marjorie Post, a sapphire for when the Court of the Jewels was here in Washington, the set of stones that went across the country. 337 carat sapphire carved. That's that not as big as it sounds. That is once Catherine the Great's. Any, any knowledge of this stone or this story? Yes, but probably not more than the curators here have. So I'll just leave their version. Um, sapphires are I feel like I skip over them a lot because they're just not my favorite. But, so, you know, that's just more evidence that basically what people do is determined by what they want. Um, I'm just not that into blue. But, you know, it is interesting. Most people don't realize that rubies are red sapphires that just got their own name. And um, it's the same way beryl that's been contaminated with chromium turns green and it's an emerald. Uh, corundum 
is another colorless crystal that gets contaminated with something and turns color. And when it's contaminated with iron, it turns blue. And it's a sapphire. And it, sapphires come in every color. And um, when it's contaminated with chromium, it turns red. And it's a ruby. But people think they're different gemstones, and they're not. And when they're colorless and, or brown, they're actually ground up and made into industrial abrasive. So if you go to Ace Hardware, and you buy sandpaper, what you've actually bought are colorless sapphires. <laughs> Does it make you feel so much better? <laughs> All right, I think we have time for a question or two in the back. Just one very quick question. Early on, we were talking about emeralds and the association of sparkle and uh, chromium and, and uniqueness. You mentally think about water. What about sapphires because of the color? <laughs> Color doesn't do well, water isn't really blue. Water's not blue. Sky is blue. Water's not blue. Sometimes water's gray, sometimes it's black, sometimes it's brown, because it's clear and it's you're either seeing through it or it's reflecting something. But water itself is not blue. What water is to your eyes is just shiny. It's just sparkly. So I know the book is mostly about history and mostly about kind of throughout uh, the ages how Due to your background as a designer and as working in the industry, how today's generation, younger people, are viewing gems and gemstones? There have been stories about, say, like Tiffany struggling with how to, to connect with younger audiences, new audiences, using you know Lady Gaga to try to. That was <laughs> such a bad idea. To try to, <laughs> to try to market. So I'm, I'm curious, you know, um, how does jewelry or shape the world today or not? Mm. Well, that's a really good question. So Tiffany's, De Beers, they're all having a really hard time selling engagement rings. They, they, got, they got about a century out of it, and it's not working anymore. <laughs> and they couldn't figure out why. And they invested in all of this market research to try to figure out why people wouldn't buy their diamond engagement rings anymore. And it turns out the reason is because we're not getting married. <laughs> if you were born after 1980, the odds are you're not married. And Millennials, uh, as they're called, are pushing off marriage to their 30s and 40s. And a lot of them just don't want to get married at all. And so this, there's this big gap between Generation X mm -hmm. and Millennials where there, there's just a lot of missing customers who didn't get married or haven't gotten married yet. Or it's a smaller consumer base. And of course, De Beers went about this the wrong way and said, we just need a new tagline. That's the problem. And really what they need is a new product. But um, the tagline they came up with was, real is rare. And so for the first time, since they came up with a diamond is forever, they trashed that advertising campaign and replaced it with a new one. And they haven't, ordinarily you would replace it every few years, but that one was so good they kept it for the last century. And they replaced it with this campaign stating real is rare, because they think that'll pluck at the right heartstrings of people who have 800,000 digital friends on Instagram <laughs> and you know they date by going like this people they've never met and so you know I have to admit it, there's there there's something a little something there, there. I feel it for yeah. sure but ultimately the way it's going to shape the future won't be through diamond rings diamonds for example it won't be through diamond rings to consumers it'll be technology um, the same way Mikimoto figured out how to grow pearls, there are people who have spent the last 10, 20 years working on figuring out how to grow diamonds. Not fake diamonds, just grow them fast. And they've succeeded, finally. And what they're going to make out of them isn't jewelry, it's computers. Mm -hmm. yeah. They're going to be the backbone of the quantum computing revolution. Mm -hmm. So ultimately, they're going to shape the world enormously, but they're going to shape the world coming out of a lab as pre-grown circuits yeah. and as um, you know, it, yeah. and others, you know, lasers, and somebody figured out how to dope the mix to make first yellow and blue because there's a boron or a nitrogen void and, and a boron void that when you put a yellow diamond and a blue diamond together, thin slices of them, you get electrons that jump back and forth. Mm -hmm. And this is, was like the holy grail of quantum computers. 
And the problem is just yellow and blue diamonds are really rare and they're usually contaminated. They, they have occlusions and they have crud in them. And so they figured out how to grow them now. And it was a short leap to figure out how to grow red diamonds, which are actually my very favorite. And I'm wearing one on my toe. Um, <laughs> And the thing about red diamonds are they have these particularly strange geomagnetic properties that with the right technology built to utilize them, they can basically GPS themselves. It'll be the end of needing a satellite to find out where on Earth you are. So, you know, gemstones have always been vital to technology. Um, England sort of won the Industrial Revolution because of their access to sapphires and industrial abrasives in the time when everything was steel. And now it's going to be who grows the best gems. All right, with that, I will close the program. Thank you so much, Asia. So Asia will be outside signing books and answering probably all the many questions we didn't get to. Thanks so much. Oh, it is. Yes, it's not one of my